Yeah. Long green pepper. Woo! Wow. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Would you want to give a shout out what part of the Philippines you're from? Parabalabang. <laughs> Most of the time when you talk about Filipino food in New York City, people will point you to Queens, New York, and that's definitely true for the traditional stuff. But these new Filipino spots in the city are doing something you've never seen before. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a very special Filipino episode of Fun Bros Food. Woo! Today we are exploring the future of Filipino cuisine in America through New York. And with us, we got Ryan Benson, the half Filipino. What's up, guys? Long time no see. We are in the Lower East Side, which is not historically known for Filipino food, but there is something that has been very special happening over the past couple years. Basically, every type of cuisine you could think of, they yeah. have it right here. The Lower East Side really is almost like a micro United Nations when it comes to food. For years now, we have been covering Filipino food on our channel all different types from the fast food to the traditional food but now we got to cover this next generation these are the type of spots that do appeal to filipino americans you know especially the hip ones but also appeal to the traditional filipinos as well 2021 the future of filipino food what's our first spot benson all right guys so we're going to our friend aris's new spot here in les chismis it's uh it's actually a filipino word for gossip which you know a lot of titas and uh would gossip over food like that's kind of like the culture you're trying to oh. yeah gossip, gossip gossip did you see who ryan brought back to the family dinner yesterday, <laughs> last week <laughs> no that is exactly what happens it's like you know everyone meets it over was a food. new girl everyone meets over food man <laughs> the, the future, future of, of filipino, filipino food. food all right guys so we're here with the chef proprietor Aris. What, yes. what are the challenges or uh, of introducing elevated Filipino food to an audience that some of them, pe people have never even had the food? The hardest part is, I think, uh, introducing them to uh, dishes from different regions. Right. Because Philippines is just not like one cuisine itself, you know. There are so many regions. So Sinigang can be in the three, four different types of... And they could taste uh, pretty different from each other. And, uh, yeah. Chismis. Let's go to Chismis and then talk about some Chismis. Let's head in, man. I'm excited. Come in and say All right, everybody. Big shout out to our sponsor today, Bright Cellars. They are a fine wine service that is pairing you with wines from across the world based off of a really quick online survey, and they're delivering them straight to your doorstep. It's like having a personal expert wine matchmaker. This is great for people who know nothing about wine and want to learn, and also wine drinkers who know what they like. I just started drinking wine this past year, and I realized I like fruity, bright wines in either red or white. And for watching our video, they're giving you, our viewers, 50% off your first six bottle box of wine. If you click on my link down below, 50% off, that is half off. That is enough to make you consider almost anything. Each box comes with wine education so you know where it comes from, what temp to serve it at, suggested pairings, basically all the info you need to impress your friends or a date. I love how you can get educated so quickly about wines. I'm not a Somme yet, but at least maybe I could have a combo about it. With great customer service and sustainable packaging, I gotta say, Bright Cellars is doing it right, making getting great wine super easy. Some of the wines they sent me that I'm super excited about are this Humdrum, which is a Viognier, this Batik, which is a Chenin Blanc, and this Watchkeeper, which is a Verdeo. And they're all very bright and light and cut the fat well. And since we're eating Filipino food, such as Kari Kari, which tend to be a little bit on the heavier side, Side, a light-bodied white wine would work perfect for the food at Chismis and Mama Fina's, for example. But again, don't take my word for it. You should just give it a shot and try it yourself by clicking on the link down below. It's leading off here at Chismis. Okay, guys, so we have Isao deep-fried like pig intestine, and then it's usually uh, given with a dip called suka, which is a vinegar-based dip, very commonly eaten with beer. Isao. It's a good drinking food because it's salty, it's fried, it makes you want to drink beer. All right, you guys, we are looking at bone marrow sinigang, short rib kare kare, and that is the intestines again. Snout and ears. All okay. right. So let's start off with these, man, because these are, it, this is like sinigang like I've never seen. Yeah, I've never seen sinigang like this. Can't wait to, to try this. Let's prep it, prep it, prep it. Let's should let's should we it. get some of the bone marrow guys yo, yo, first? Yo, scoop that with a knife. No, oh, I'm already in here with a fork. You're gonna Ooh. take a lot. Try the city wow. go with this. Oh, there wow. we go. Woo. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Dish? Bone marrow going onto the that is some ice. Juicy gossip. Bone, Bone marrow city Oh, wow. Wow, bro. The tamarind really comes out in this broth, but it's super balanced. The dipping sauce. That, wow. You dip that it. That sauce. I gotta try a little bit. The short rib from the synagogue with this with a little bit of bone marrow melted in to give it that creaminess. 
five out of five, hands down. I'm not saying that just to say it. That's a five out of five. I mean, wow. Banger. Yo, that was so good. That's, yeah? That was, was it? Ryan said it was better than his mom's. It was better than Yeah? Him. Did I beat your mom? You did. I beat? I beat <laughs> you beat oh, your sorry, mom. Sorry, mom. <laughs> yeah, sorry, mom. I mean, listen, my mom, my mom's singing going is amazing, but this, it just takes it to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Wow. Woo! <laughs> oh no! We're moving on. Uh, Ryan, to, to reference, you had a, a funny moment in another video with the Bagaun in the sense of uh, you, 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 you like a lot. In I like a lot in it. It's like how my aunt used to make it for me. It was her favorite dish growing up. And guys, it's been portioned out already. So <laughs> this is how you're supposed to eat it. You guys gotta get messy. Come on, man. It's still Filipino food, right? That's we can still right. get messy right now, right? right? We yeah. still got our hands dirty. That's right. Short rib kai kai. Oh my god. That's unbelievable. The best kare kare I have ever had. I love it. It has that peanut flavor, but it doesn't taste like peanut butter. Yeah. And it's just working so well on that short rib. Now, Aris, would you say this is kind of like your take on a CC? Pretty much Sisig style, but we call it Dinakdakan. Dinakdakan. Hey, this is Ilocano food, guys. Oh my Mine. god. Wow, I love that. For me, I'm going with the bone marrow synagogue for me. See, the kare kare is the best kare kare I've had, but this Dinakdakan is out of this world. I, I, I gotta roll with the Dinakdakan and then the kare kare tied for my favorite, man. Aris, I gotta say, man, I think Chismis is setting a new standard for new Filipino restaurants, Thank man. You Thank so you. Much, oh my goodness. Thank you for having you us here. Thank you. And you guys, we are continuing on our new Filipino food crawl 2021, hosted by Ryan Benson. All right, you guys, next up on our modern Filipino food crawl through the LES East Village is Mama Fina's. Ryan, where are we at? So Mama Fina's is known as the house of CC. They've been serving up different varieties of CC since they've opened in New Jersey in 2004. Like the demographic here is a lot of students, locals, family. Like my mom knows Mama Fina's back in Jersey. We're gonna try different types of seasick. Okay, so you're here. What do you think about all the different varieties of seasick that they have here? Is that traditional? Is that something you might find in the Philippines? Uh, you'll probably find something, but uh, because this one is mostly catered to the like, New Yorker taste. Uh -huh. So, but this is the closest thing you can get in terms of like uh, seasick and all of that. So, especially like the bongi seasick or the pork, those okay. are like, yeah. What is your favorite seasick? Let me add go with uh, the bangu. Yes. Oh, what, do you want to give a shout out? What part of the Philippines are from? Parakalabang. <laughs> All right, you guys, we are here at Mama Fina's. So we have the uh, uh, sisig pusit, which is the squid uh, sisi. Sisig si what? Pusit. Pusit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Si yeah. Si I'm, I'm 15. <laughs> you're you're, you're going to make that joke, yeah. huh? As you guys know, sisig is usually used from like leftover parts. It kind of originated from uh, a Navy base in the Philippines because they were able to get uh, pig heads for basically free. Here we have laing, which okay. is... Uh, shredded um, taro leaves with, it usually has a uh, coconut influence in it. And then we have the crispy fried galanga, which is like baby crabs. Is it interesting to see these things represented in Manhattan? Yeah, I think it's really cool. Um, and it kind of speaks to how diverse, like the cuisine, the Filipino cuisine can be. And, you know, to that note, like every everywhere that we've been going here today, like there's been a different crowd of Filipinos. Right, coming in and out. Uh, Sagot gulaman, which is uh, gulamon, which is like the Filipino version of like a uh, boba. Squid seasick. Mm. Wow. Mm. It's got this really cool crunch to it. I might personally like that better than the pork one. So if you guys look really closely, you can see the little pieces of squid right there. That's the tentacle that's usually like kind of purple or dark colored, and it's really fried to a crisp. So this is the crispiest squid I've ever had. <laughs> Latin. This is like the Filipino collard greens. Mm. That's good Latin. Wow. Mama Fina's would be more of your traditional fare, and I think that's why you see a little bit more uh, people from back home here in uh, Mama Fina's. And uh, obviously, they put a little bit of a twist on it by making it like squid, but everything else is pretty, pretty, pretty much traditional. Crispy, Crispy galanga, aka fried crabs. But this is really good. It goes super well with that vinegar-based sauce. Mm. I mean. You can't go wrong. The food here has been- The is, food at Mama Fina's is good. It's really good. And I mean, they've really upheld the standards that I remember back in Jersey. This drink is very sweet. It almost tastes like a sugar cane drink. Super well with all this fried food. Mm -hmm. Kind of helps cut through that, that 
fried like fattiness a little bit. All right, we're wrapping it up here at Mama Fina's for our future of Filipino food episode. We gotta go to a couple more spots. All right, you guys, we are on the world famous McDougal Street right now. There's a ton of <laughs> ethnic street foods, comedy clubs, the oh, comedy right. sellers yeah. here. And of course, what are we in front of? So we're right here in front of Mighty Bowls where they put a modern fusion twist on uh, Filipino rice bowls. Right, I'll, they kind of do Pan-Asian flavors as well, right? Yeah. I think it's really cool what they're doing here. They're making it in bowl form. That's great for lunchtime. It, it delivers great. And I always say this, based on the current and immediate demographic of the street, I would not expect a Filipino-owned bowl spot to be on McDougal. Shout out to them opening uh, during the pandemic for delivery. We did order from them uh, several times. This one is from Manila. It's called it the Manila because why is that? Because I, I know this is called the uh, lechon, right? Yeah, the lechon, lechon kawali. All right, you guys, we are doing what this bowl spot allows you to do. We're on one of the liveliest streets in New York City right now, McDougal, having a lechon kawali in a bowl. Yeah, man, so we're eating this real New York style. We're walking, we're talking, um, we're working right now. So we got the lechon kawali, the Manila bowl right here with poached egg, some crispy garlic, and also some bok choy. Oh man, that lechon kawali is so good. It's so crispy yet fatty. Yo, I feel like this is a marathon, right Here, quick, take a hit of this coconut water. Oh, you get the bowl. <laughs> what do you think it means that, you know, the creators of Mighty Bowls were still from the Philippines though? Like it was still very authentic, even though obviously they have to twist the recipes to make money and, and be successful in the business environment. I think it's really cool that, you know, the owners can come from the Philippines and make this concept so that it's a lot more palatable palatable to the New York crowd, right? Because everybody likes, everybody eats like rice bowls out here, but it nobody really sees the Filipino rice bowl uh, in that game. It's almost like Panda express Eyesing Filipino food, which, uh, despite how long Filipinos have been in America, it has yet to happen, right? Yeah, man, and, and, but it's it's kind of put a little bit of an elevated twist on it. Obviously, you're not getting the, the food quality of a Panda Express. You're still getting real, like, well-cooked uh, pork belly, lechon kawale. No, no, Panda still could be, it could be good. Honestly, that is one of the best quick Asian bowls I've ever had before. It was from Mighty Bowls, Filipino-owned, McDougal Street, one of the craziest streets really in New York in a in ecology way. You know, by doing this video that people will come and support Mighty Bowls a little bit more and try out this new way to do Filipino on the go. Filipino Bowls, on to the next spot. Okay, now we're here at our last spot, Cabacera on Allen Street. This spot is really like a Filipino hub of culture, food, desserts. They have hot food as well. Oh man, this place is like known for serving merienda type snacks. Really elevated desserts and slushies and drinks here. And you know what they do that is similar to our last video in uh, LA's historic Filipino town is sometimes, not today, they have almost that dollar hit style of uh, Filipino barbecue skewers. So yeah. on Saturdays and Sundays, they have a pop-up here that comes in and they do the barbecue right outside. Guys, come check it out. The food is unreal. The dessert trend has been on the rise and this place does dessert right. Let's check it out, Cabacera. All right, Joey, you are from Batan. Yes. Two hours from Manila. What are we looking at right here? This we, is what we're looking here is the Filipino desserts, the halo halo, the famous halo halo, and the calamansi juice, the slushy calamansi, and we have the matcha ube. The way that they do it here, they kind of really elevate it. The presentation is kind of next level. Look at that! Look at that shaved ice, though. It is like an ube flavored shaved ice, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Cabecera halo halo. It's honestly the best halo halo that I've had on any of the food series that we've done. Yeah. Thank you. Hey man, kudos to you guys, man. All right, man, like we said, they're bringing all types of stuff to the Lower East Side. Halo halo. We got the calamansi juice right here, and then we got a little bit of a fusion item right here. This is an ube matcha. Super, super fragrant. Tastes really good. Has a nice tart citrus to it, but it's still sweet. Bring you guys the cassava cake and the biko. Cassava, cassava is a traditional Filipino dessert. 
and it's made of uh, grated cassava, uh, coconut milk, and uh, which one's the cassava one? This one. Oh, okay, just cassava is what they make bobas out of. Yeah, yeah, all right. That, it has that QQ, and then uh, they finish it on top with some custard. And this is a biko, which is a sweet rice uh, per flavored with purple yam and coconut uh, flakes on top. You gotta try some of this. It's super well balanced. It's not too sweet. It's like super glutinous from the from the rice. Oh man, for me, I'm gonna go with the Biko. Yeah. The Biko, this is so good. Something if people are familiar with like the mango sticky rice at a Thai spot, exactly. but almost with more focus on the rice, obviously because we're missing the mango. Was it always a, a goal of yours when you came to America to, to showcase sort of Filipino culture and show what you guys bring to the right. Milo or, or right. potluck in America? Of Asian foods are already on the mainstream, Japanese food, Thai. Now it's time, you know, we bring in the Filipino food and the Filipino desserts to the mainstream. To what do you think level. of all the other Asian cafes serving <laughs> ube, even though they're not Filipino? It's okay? Uh, <laughs> it's okay, but this one is made from scratch. Okay, all right. It's okay, but he just wants to let you all know, <laughs> the ube, they made it from scratch, scratch. All right, Joey, what are we looking at here? Now, what we're looking at here are bibinka and the leche flan. That, that we have. Both of these are made here at Cabecera and Bibinka is famous, you know, on the Filipino uh, desserts uh, circle uh, with coffee. It goes very well. It's a sweet rice bread with coconut flakes uh, and uh, sometimes they put uh, egg on top of it. And then the leche flan is just, it's sort of like you guys take on a... It's like a custard. Like uh, a Spain from yes. Spain? Yep. All right. Joey told me that the, the Dominicans, the Puerto Ricans, the Mexicans, they really like the, this version of flan. It's distinct in its own way, right? I think, you know, leche de flan, it, it comes based from like a Spanish recipe, but the way that they do it in the Philippines adds that little bit of extra Filipino love that you can taste in the food, so. Dude, I like it a lot, man. Yeah. I, Cause you know what it is? I think uh, sometimes, you know, and I respect everybody's thing. Like some people use like cinnamon in it, but then you guys are using more coconut yeah. and more like uh, the cassava syrup and stuff like that. It's a little that, bit more tropical. More, more tropical Asian, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yo, Andrew, oh. yo, you oh. gotta try this. I just got back. Flan de leche. Joey has been breaking down yes. everything. Why? Flan de leche. From, um, well, flan de let me taste it. You know, <laughs> we gotta we gotta give a highlight on. Um, I'm sorry if I'm gonna mess up. I'm gonna murder the city name again. All right, man. I just had a had to go for a little ride, so I'm a little thirsty. Let me try this uh, Machu Bay. Machu Bay. Oh, I kind of like it. It's a little bit of bitterness with the creamy sweetness of the ube, so that's a cool mixture. A lot of bibingers that I've had can give, can be a little bit too dense. This is nice and fluffy, and the texture is really, really on point, and it's not too sweet. Yo, let us buy a trinket, man. We gotta come with us. We're gonna buy a trinket here. What's the one? Cabacera for the culture. All right, so Joey, I got like a budget of ten dollars. I'm trying to spend. What should I buy that's going to be really like Filipino? Oh. Well, we have here the uh, Filipino keychains. It's like you know, influenced by you know Filipino traditional uh, uh, desserts and street foods. Like Filipino the, barbecue uh, keychain. <laughs> like it's between the chicharron or the Filipino bacon. I think you gotta go with the chicharron. All right, the chicharron. That that reminds me of like my Lolo, right? Yo, know, they did a good job of recreating it. I'm getting the chicharron keychain. All right, so that brings us to the end of our Future of Filipino food video. Um, man, what did you guys notice? I noticed that actually all the owners of uh, Sismas, Mama Fina's, Cabecera are actually very traditional Filipinos that are maybe like 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, but have been educated in the West and they're sort of translating it, but they're not necessarily like Phil Ams. They're not Filipino yeah. Americans. I think it's really cool that these Filipino chef owners are able to come from the Philippines and kind of bring this more modern twist to traditional food that can be more uh, directed towards Filipino Americans rather than just traditional Filipino like fobs coming from back in the Philippines. Well, they, they, it kind of like gets all the crowds. Yeah. Because I think the traditionalist obviously gets the people from that country. It gets white people who are interested in like culture and anthropology. And then you also get um, the Phil Ams who, you know, have a space to, to connect with their roots. And I, I think because of this, it's really starting to drive that food trend. You know, you're seeing Filipino dessert places opening up everywhere. And I think it's, it's really great to see that like people can take our culture and twist it still have that little bit of traditional uh, traditional kind of like culture coming through, but with that modern twist. Andrew, what do you think it means for like 
Asian American food because, you know, there's a few Asian American spots that were very successful, namely in spots like OC, the West Coast. But it seems like on the East Coast, there's still more with the UN United Nations traditional style. Yeah, I think New York, when it comes to ethnic food, it's still at that point where they still really want the more authentic version. And that's why the 50-50 fusion stuff in New York doesn't work as well. It's not that it doesn't work, it's just a little bit harder of a sell, and it takes a little bit more context for people it's to more understand. It's West Coast Hawaii yeah. to think like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you, because people still want to know that it's coming from that traditional place, that's why it's a little bit harder for Chinese Americans or Filipino Americans to serve their food here. Um, I think that having someone who's from there that's just a little bit more westernized, that's like maybe studied in the West, studied in America, that has that flair and can do kind of that 80% traditional, 20% American style. Rather I think that's gonna work better even than the 50-50, at least in New York City. So statistically speaking, most Asians living in America are actually still immigrants. Yeah. So you would think that a lot of those immigrants still want some sense that their food is very traditional and authentic. So that's why the market for the 50-50 American and Asian fusion is a little bit smaller than people would like to think. I think the that's 50 very OC. You I, see that all the time in the OC. The time, yeah, like, the time. I think the 50-50 is cool, but I understand for the mass market, you know, and for most Asians who are in America still, it's tough. All right, you guys, please let us know in the comments section below what was your favorite traditional item that we covered today and what was a slight twist that you liked or what's a slight twist to a traditional item that you'd like to see on the menu of one of these spots. And until next time, huge shout out to Ryan Benson, Hopper representative. We out. Peace. Peace.